Okay, let me start from the beginning. All right, I'm gonna call, I, I've called this cryptocurrency as a tool of liberation, how we can use technology to give the poor control over their finances. Um, now, before I get into this, it can, now, can everyone hear and see what I'm doing? Yes? Yep. Okay. And, and I apologize ahead of time for people who are on the phone that you can't see these, these sterling graphics, but I'll try to explain everything that I show. Um, one of the reasons that this kind of interested me is because as a person who himself grew up in poverty um, and has had a lot of interactions with our um, country's banking system and financial institutions, I noticed that the richer you are, the less fees you have to pay, generally speaking. You know, for so for example, if you can get 2000 bucks into your account in some banks, you don't have to pay any fees. Now, I don't know about you, but I normally don't carry 2000 bucks in my account as a general rule. So what happens is you end up paying these fees and even though they're little fees, they still kind of add up. And then if you're overdrawn, that's another fee. And then if you're sending money to someone, that's another fee. So I kind of just started thinking to myself, why do we have to pay all these fees? Now, this is where the whole cryptocurrency thing came in because I started looking at cryptocurrency and I have friends who are into it. And I started noticing that this might be a system that really can liberate people from a lot of these, what I consider taxing fees and, and um, other things that, that are inherently bad about the way we do finances as not only just our country, but just all over the world. So let me just get into this presentation. Um, is everybody still with me so far? I will take yep. that as a yes. Yep. Okay. So uh, since I lived in Canada, that's why I'm using the Canadian money background. I lived in Canada for four years. For those of you who don't know that I lived in Newfoundland. Um, okay, come on. Okay. What is money and what's its history? And I want to kind of start off with that. So what is money? So I'm using the definition that money is anything that serves as a medium of exchange. And I have a funny little video I want to play. Now this video does have cursing, so I want to apologize ahead of time for the Amish in my um, uh, audience. <laughs> Um, and maybe the Mormons too, although I know lots of Mormons who curse. So I don't know if that's as big a deal. <laughs> um, so I want to play this video it's by The Onion and it talks about a barter economy that is developing in a prison system. So let me click on this link and hopefully this will play and everyone can see it. And we'll start from there, come on. The cost of a pack of cigarettes has well, gone up. Let me to Onion News Network prison economics expert Hal Rogan. Hal, I never thought I'd see the day when cigarettes cost more than one hand job. Why the sudden spike now? Well, most analysts are tracing it back to the Brothers Pius's pop off at San Quentin Friday. Right. The lockdown that resulted there cut cigarette imports up to 66% across the West Coast system. That's a much steeper drop off than anyone saw coming. Oh, you better believe it. But of course, we shouldn't discount the recent influx of punks at Chino. Of course. According to reports, more than 80% of these fish were greeners, willing mm -hmm. to give two hand jobs and a stick of beef jerky for a pack of rollies. And their exuberance is what's causing the increases we're seeing in so many other sectors today, from baby oil to trazers to chest. That's yes, from bars yes, so. absolutely. Look, the prison economy runs on cigarettes. They're involved in every economic transaction at some stage, mm -hmm. from contract killings to naked woman picture acquisition. Right. That's why we've got shampoo at six batteries. We've Whoa. got tattoos at 50 commissary stamps, slocks at a stick and a muff bag. That's incredible. Yes. How nervous are investors at this well, point? Well, it's hard to tell since most of them have trained themselves to never show fear. But clearly, there were a lot of jitters across the market this morning after reports came that the impending Chiva deal between Rico Perez and Bones Gorman was called off after a pigeon told hacks to put Bones on shit watch. Mm -hmm. 
Now for what it's really like out there in the market, let's check in with major cigarette trader Big Dap Ramirez. Big Dap, nice to see you again. Thanks, Rick. Good to see you. What's happening, huh? How's it going, Big Dap? Now, it's obviously a boom time for cigarettes right now. I am getting a lot of hands But with jobs. prices this high, analysis shows you're going to be seeing a drop-off in real sales soon as consumers turn to smoking grass fejos. Look, we've been through this before. The market teaches us not to panic. Mm. But if I learn anything in this game, it's that a wife or girlfriend will pass off a few decks in the boneyard. Supply will normalize, and we'll see cigarettes returning to a single hand job or less. Let's hey, Big Dap, in the interim, what are investors like yourself supposed to do? All I can say is monitor your assets carefully. Mm. This morning I got stabbed with a sharpened toothbrush by this bitch Django who tried to crib my supply. I fucked him up bad in the library. But hey, that's the way the market's going to be for a while. It is. All right, Big Dap, best of luck to you. We'll keep checking in on the story with Hal throughout the day. Thanks, Rick. Moving on to some happier news. In Atlanta today, two snitches were beaten to death. All right, let me go back to my presentation. So, while that's kind of a comical way of looking at it, this is what um, money can take a lot of different forms. For example, in Romania, under the Communist Party rule during the 80s, a pack of cigarettes served as a medium of exchange. That's kind of why I played that video. So let's see. Money serves basically three basic functions. It's a medium of exchange. Goods or services are exchanged and serve as money. It's a unit of account, a consistent means of measuring the value of things. And it's a store of value. You know, the $20 you lost a year ago and recently found in your couch is still worth $20 more or less. Now, we're not counting inflation. So don't, some of you start saying, hey, wait a minute, that's not true. Now, I understand that it does vary, but the whole point of having money or, or, or having money that works is that I shouldn't be, have to take 20 bucks to a store and they say, oh, that's only worth 10 now. Now that happens in countries where the, again, the currency is, you know, suffering from hyperinflation. And there are stories, for example, in Weimar, Germany, where people have to bring real barrels for worth, worth of money just to get a, some bread. But anyway, let's, let's move on. I wanna go over kind of a real brief history of money. And again, I wanna apologize ahead of time. I can't cover everything. I was actually thinking as I was doing this, this um, um, presentation, that I, that I have a brother from Australia and I probably should have talked about their monetary system. Although to, to be quite honest, if I remember my history of Australia correctly, their monetary system was tied to the British empire. So, um, but anyway, let me- Great question. I'm not sure on that. Uh, huh? Yeah. Not, not anymore, not since, I don't know how oh, long no, ago. No, no, not, no, not now. <laughs> But I'm talking about in its first formation, if I remember correctly. Oh, well, we were the British Empire in our first formation. Unfortunately, that yeah. changed. <laughs> well, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as, as I, um, in, in the picture in the background, what you are seeing is a Chinese, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Yong, Yongle. And this is dating back 600 years. This was actually found in Kenya issued by the Emperor Yongle during the Ming Dynasty. Now the Emperor sent Admiral Zihi to explore countries beyond the South China Sea. And it shows how economies in Africa, even hundreds or, or, you know, of years ago, were starting to develop cash money as their basis of economy. Um, so archeologists found this coin in Africa and they started noticing uh, um, when they did more digging that there was a vibrant economy, you know, six, seven, 800 years ago where there was trading not only around the Mediterranean but in, you know, different parts of the world even extending to China. So let's continue and continue our brief history of money. Okay. So in the beginning, money was basically barter, just like I showed you in that video. Um, the exchange of resources or services for mutual advantage has existed from the dawn of humanity 
first with animals, then with the advent of agriculture, grain. And then we got into coins and paper. Coins were, were introduced in China around 500 BC. They had the imprints of gods and emperors on them during the Song Dynasty because of a metal shortage. Paper notes were introduced. And these paper notes were brought back to Europe in the 13th century by Marco Polo. People were kind of amazed. Oh, wow, they used paper as a form of money. Um, that hadn't quite caught on in Europe um, before this. Um, now, an interesting inscription on this Chinese money that Marco Polo came back, and this is because they were fighting counterfeiters, is those who are counterfeiting may be decapitated, will be decapitated. Now, I don't think this is going to replace the U.S. motto of God we trust, but it was an interesting description anyway. Now, in Europe, the first true banknotes were issued in Sweden in 1661. After that, many European countries followed suit with various degrees of excess. The, the problem that they started having when banknotes were introduced is that the, because of the poor quality of the printing, there was a lot of counterfeiting. So they, it took them a long time to kind of get that right. Now, fast forward to 1999, when the euro was introduced and informally adopted in 2002, this became a currency of the European Union, of course, excluding Great Britain. Um, now, the advent of digital money. And again, I apologize. I know there's a lot of other history considering the, uh, talking about the history of money, but since I only have a certain amount of time, I can't cover everything. Now, first proposed by American cryptographer, David Chom in a paper published in 1983 called Blind Signatures for Untraceable Cash, a concept of digitalized money came into being in 1989 in the form of DigiCash, which allowed shoppers in certain stores to pay for goods directly out of their bank account. Now remember, up until this time, either you wrote a check or you had a credit card, if you had a credit card, or you just paid cash. There was no concept of digital money in that sense. Um, and remember, this was also really the beginnings of the advent of the internet and other things. So uh, you had this man, David, come up with this idea. And let's continue. Okay. Unfortunately, this, it didn't catch on because the technology was not friendly enough to get consumers on board. So DigiCash actually filed for bankruptcy in 1998. But... Out of this was born PayPal with um, our favorite, uh, who's one of the founders of PayPal's our favorite billionaire, Elon Musk, um, which allowed individuals to quickly and securely transfer money via the web. And again, this is, um, now people started to see the advantage. And remember around the same time, Amazon started coming on board and people started seeing the advantage of just being able to just pay for something um, just out of their bank account without having to use any inter, uh, as, uh, a few intermediaries. Now let's continue. These ideas and others that followed laid the foundation for a true revolution in currency in 2008 with the arrival of Bitcoin. Now, before we continue, I wanted to um, insert um, Aristotle because when is it not appropriate to talk about Aristotle um, and his principle of sound money. And this is kind of important going forward because one of the criticisms of uh, cryptocurrency is that it's not real money. It's not, you know, it's, it, it's something else. And you hear this criticism a lot, but I think that if we remember what sound money or good money is, then we cannot kind of fit cryptocurrency under that. So this was, idea was developed around three, 
50 B B E. Uh, hold on. Aristotle wanted to define the characteristics of good or sound money. So he came up with these principles. First of all, it had to be durable. It has to hold up to the test of time without fading and corroding in significant ways. And for those of you in my audience from America, you know that at, after a while, money is taken out of circulation and um, basically sent to the US Mint and it's burned. There are plenty of movies that talk about stealing this money and stuff like that. That's how most of us know about this. But for the most part, our currency and other currencies are built to last 10, 15 years. Um, so that's what I mean by durable. So next, um, okay, it has to be portable. Good money has to hold a high amount of worth relative to size and weight. So you don't wanna be carrying around gold bars all the time. You don't want it to carry around a stone or something. So this is where the advent of money and coins came in. It has to be portable and it has to be, you know, you have to be, it has to represent what it's, what it's worth in an easy way. Divisible or fungible, sound money must be relatively easy to separate and recombine with effect, with affecting its fundamental characteristics. So I should be able to take a dollar and change it into 25, you know, four quarters or something. So it has to be divisible, it has to be easily divisible. And we continue. It has to be recognizable. Sound money should be easy to recognize and authenticate. Um, so you don't, uh, you, you want to be able to have something that people look at and say, okay, this is, um, this is a $20 bill. I've seen a $20 bill. I can take it to any merchant in any place in the country. They know what a $20 or a $50 bill is. In fact, this is a, a problem we ran into in the US um, when we came out with the $2 coin. I remember having one and taking the store and the merchant wouldn't take it because he had never seen one. So this is kind of why the dollar coins, the $2 coins, I mean, they actually still exist, but you don't see anyone using it because it's not recognizable. People don't trust it, so they don't use it. Now, before I continue, are there any questions at this point? Or anybody want to add an anecdote or something? Um, the, the, does anybody who's listening live in a country where they use dollar coins or $2 coins? I don't know if they do that in Australia or any place else. Yeah, we have um, one and two dollar coins. Yep. And it's used pretty widely. Um, I think cash has stopped being used altogether. Well, yeah, I mean, I, when you do use cash, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I got, I got my my bank cancelled my cash card, so I got my last bit of cash out, and I, I don't think I'll be needing it ever again in the current rate of progress because it's just kind of evaporating everywhere. But yes. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry your said, card was cancelled, but okay. Well, that's Famous just last they, words before the apocalypse, Jonathan. Like, we'll not need <laughs> cash ever again. <laughs> yeah, that, that's but, pretty much the attitude around the country at the moment, I think. Yeah. But, like but yes, yeah, so up until last year, yeah, we did use um, <clears throat> we did use it. If I want to get cash out of my bank now, I've got to um, send money to my wife and get her to take it out, I think. <laughs> yeah, and I remember when I lived in Canada, they would have coins that would represent a dollar or or you know uh, but in america that just never caught on so again this is why whatever money is put out it has to be something that the populace can trust and it has to be intrinsically valuable sound money should have a value independent of any other object of value it should, it should be contained in the money itself so um this kind of touches on the whole gold standard thing. And, and, and I, I, um, this is something Europe went through and in America went through. They got on the gold standard, get off the gold standard. Um, and then people started asking, well, if you're not, if our money's not backed on gold, what does it work? Well, at least in the case of America, 
it's based on the um, trust of the US government, that we have a sound government, that we have a sound system, and that we can pay our debts. Um, now in some countries, for example, Venezuela, no insult to those who are in Venezuela, they're having a problem with their money because the government, it's not exactly trustworthy. We're actually gonna talk about that later. Um, but this is also the reason I'm bringing up the, 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 the thing with Aristotle is that I believe cryptocurrency fulfills at least four, if not all of these. Now, now the only problem that I think, or one of the problems with cryptocurrency is for example, the recognizableness. Now that's changing with the younger generation. And then the intrinsic value, there's still a real big debate on what exactly is cryptocurrency and is it exactly, and why is Bitcoin worth $32,000 a coin? You know, but the argument I guess I would put forth uh, uh, concerning that is um, well, we have the same argument with stocks. You know, why is AMC worth, I think it's $56 now? Why is GameStop worth 200 bucks? They sell video games. I, I mean, I, no, one, no one can explain other than there's a populist sentiment that love these certain stocks. And this is, this is how it's been with investment for years. You'll always see stocks taking off, you know, and, and there's just some frenzy of, uh, around them. So, you know, the whole sound intrinsic value, uh, the, to me, sometimes it's in the eye of the beholder. But let's continue. Now, where, wh why did cryptocurrency come into existence at all? Now, most of you are old enough to remember the 2008 global meltdown. Um, and this is the genesis of where cryptocurrency came into existence. So this is very important to talk about. Now, what, what, was, what was the 2008 global meltdown, where did it come from? In the late 1990s, the Federal National Mortgage Association, Fannie Mae, that was commonly known, began its crusade to make home loans accessible to borrowers with low credit scores. Now, this was very noble at first because a lot of people couldn't afford houses. So there was a big push in the late 1990s. Um, I think Clinton was, was president at the time, but he was. There was a big push to, to, to make housing more accessible. So how do you make housing more accessible? Well, you gotta be able to give people who don't traditionally qualify for homes access to loans. And the way you do that is you take risks with borrowers who have lower credit scores and that's what banks did. Uh, now, while housing prices continue to increase, the rising subprime mortgage markets thrive. So there was plenty of money sloshing around. So they were able to give out these loans. Because housing values rose so quickly, the increase in home equity offset the bad debt builder. There were people who were defaulting on their loans, but that was okay because, you know, the homes were worth a lot and they could just sell them and make money anyway. If a borrower defaulted, the banks could foreclose without taking a loss on the sale. Now, does anyone know what the problem is? Just without me saying anything else, what do you think that the problem is when you run a, a, a system like this. Anyone can chime in. It's based on mm, confidence. Go ahead. I was gonna say, I didn't pay, pay enough attention in the big short uh, to <laughs> figure out all the, the details of this, but... Uh, yeah, that sounds, John, Jonathan's answer sounds good to me. It's basically well, a game of musical, mm -hmm. it's basically a game of musical chairs. At some point, prices on housing are not going to keep rising. It's a bubble. 
and someone is going to be left holding the bag. The millennials. And as was just said, let me go, let me continue. The resulting seller's market meant that if a homeowner couldn't afford the payments, he could sell his house, as I just said, and the equity would cover the loss. But housing prices began to fall in 2007. And by 2008, we had the crash. 2008 stock market crash took place. I remember this very vividly because I also remembered I had just gotten out of the army in 1987. There was a crash then too, and this was kind of similar. So in September 29, 2008, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell by almost 800%. This is the largest single day loss in Dow Jones history up to this point, and it came with the years of Congress rejecting a bank bailout bill. And I remember, I remember this so clearly, watching the news and watching these Congress people saying, we're not going to bail out these banks. They can go to hell. We don't care. And secretly in my mind, I was thinking, they're going to bankrupt the whole economy. I mean, these banks are going to take the whole country down. I, I don't want to bail them out either, but I, I need to, we're, we're, we're kind of stuck here. So too many people had taken loans they couldn't afford. Lenders relaxed the strict lending standards to, ex to extend credit to people who were less than qualified, as I said before. This shows up housing price at levels that many could not otherwise afford. September 2008, investment firm Lehman Brothers collapsed because of its overexposure. And they were using a lot of what I call tricky ways of manipulating money, um, the credit default swaps and really exotic money, um, ways of handling money. Um, okay. Um, it was the largest bankruptcy filing in U.S. history up to that point. Later that month, the Federal Reserve announced a bailout of the insurance giant American International Group. Now remember, American International Group was covering the investments of Lehman Brothers. So guess what happened when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt? Well, of course, they didn't have the money to cover it. So that's where the Federal Reserve, basically our economy was at the point, had the Federal Reserve not stepped in, we would have he headed into a depression. The uh, people were, were trying to take money out of their banks and, and they weren't able to. Uh, it was just an absolute nightmare. Um, but guess who didn't get a bailout? The poor and the middle class. Between 2007 and 2009, the country lost almost 3 million jobs. Americans lost nine. Point eight trillion dollars of wealth as their home values plummet and their retirement accounts vaporize. I remember this because I remember friends telling me they had a million dollars in their retirement account and then they had a hundred thousand dollars. And again, this kind of exposed problems in our financial system because you were basically at the mercy of these banks who were kind of playing with your money and that's fine as long as you're making money. But when you're not making money, no, one, no one's there to make you whole. You know, one, one of the criticisms of the bailout is you bailed out everyone except the people who actually lost money. You know, you, you didn't bail out the, the, the people who lost their homes and lost their retirement accounts. So this caused people to think, can't we have a better monetary system that doesn't, does not centralize wealth in the hands of a few? Well, this is where the, uh, the Bitcoin and the rise of cryptocurrency came in. So again, to recap, when U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy in 2008, it shook people's faith in banks so much 
that a new class of asset, which had not been, that didn't have the bank of any former bank came into being Bitcoin. The most popular cryptocurrency found, first found a mention in November 2000, after, two months after the Lehman crisis. As the world's financial infrastructure started crumbling, the domain name Bitcoin was registered later in 2008, a person or group using the, name, the pseudonym Santosh Nakamoto. We, we don't know who this person is, by the way, to this day published a white paper on Bitcoin to a, crypt, a cryptography mailing list explaining how cryptocurrency would work. And in this paper, the main property of the system, Santosh said, would be that the electronic transaction would be peer to peer and would not need to be sent to a financial institution. The system was designed to be completely decentralized meaning the users of the currency would not need to repose their trust in a central authority such as a traditional central bank. So basically he's trying to cut out the middleman. Um, a couple of months after floating the idea of this cryptocurrency, Santosh created 50 Bitcoins with the very first transaction on a blockchain at 8.15.05 hours on 3rd January 19, um, 2009. This is, um, this is one of the birthdays of Bitcoin, by the way. And on May 2, and this is another one, this is the, actually the first physical transaction. On May 2010, a Florida programmer named um, Lazio Hainik, I, I can't pronounce it, offered 10,000 Bitcoins and in change for a pizza. A British enthusiast took Hainik on his offer, up on his offer and ordered two pizzas to be delivered from a pizza place near Hainik's residence. The Britain paid for the pizza using a credit card and Hainik reimbursed the purchase with 10,000 Bitcoins. This is believed to be the first time Bitcoin was ever used to make a purchase and May 22nd is celebrating the Bitcoin community as Bitcoin Pizza Day, in fact, that just passed recently. Um, so this is the first time that they ever used a cryptocurrency in this way to actually buy a physical item. Let's continue. So what is cryptocurrency and how does it work? Now, I'm gonna try to explain this, but some of you may not be satisfied with this, so just kind of stick with me. Cryptocurrency is a digital currency that is exchanged between peers without the need of a third party, as I said before, like a bank. It enables consumers to digitally connect directly through a transparent process, showing the financial amount, but not the identity of the people conducting the transaction. More about this later. The network consists of a chain of computers which are all required to approve the cryptocurrency exchange, and prevent duplication of the same transaction because of its transparency, this type of transaction has the potential to reduce fraud. So let's go into, um, let's go into the weeds just a little bit about how it works. Let's go a little deeper into it. Transaction. This is a transfer of currency between two digital wallets. The transaction is submitted to a public ledger, a blockchain, to await confirmation before the exchange can be concluded. During the transaction, an encrypted electronic signature based on mathematical forms required as proof of ownership. The confirmation process is conducted by people called miners. You, 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 if you've been following cryptocurrency, you heard this whole term of miners. These are people who run computers who process and verify crypto transactions. And the reason that the, that uh, at least to me, this system is very good in one sense, is that one central authority does not control this. This is farmed out to a whole lot of people. So it's, it's, it's very decentralized. Let's continue. Public ledger. Once a transaction is confirmed by a miner, it is stored in a public ledger called a blockchain. The public ledger verifies ownership of the cryptocurrency and ensures legitimacy of the record keeping. By the way, um, this ledger is open to anyone to look at. 
So it's not, it, it, this is why it's called a public legend. Anyone can see it, it's transparent. Um, you know, so in that sense, everybody's kept honest by it. Mining, this is the process that confirms transactions before they may be added to the public ledger. Miner must know how to solve a computational puzzle called proof of work to, present, to prevent exploitation of cryptocurrency mining. Mining is open source, which then anyone on the network can confirm the transaction before adding the transaction block to the public ledger or blockchain. Miners receive a fee for the cryptocurrency, in cryptocurrency for their work. So again, it's public. I could set up a, I could set up a mining operation in my house. Now, before we continue, because I don't necessarily, I don't think I addressed this in, in the other parts of my presentation. There's a big controversy as far as mining for cryptocurrency, as far as its environmental impact. And it is true Cryptocurrency mining takes a lot of power to do. You need a lot of computers working to do this. But the people who are doing the mining are aware of that and they're starting to switch from traditional sources of power to green power. You're seeing this switch. Um, Elon Musk actually made a comment on that saying that Bitcoin, the problem with Bitcoin is, is that it's not environmentally friendly. And people have started to pick up on that and said, okay, you know, we need to depend on solar power, wind power, hydropower. In fact, um, El Salvador that just adopted Bitcoin as one of their um, legal tenders, currency tenders, um, is developing a huge hydroelectric project just for Bitcoin, just for a cryptocurrency mining. So this is being addressed, but it is an issue within the community. Are there any questions before I continue? So what you're saying is that a good Christian transhumanist mines crypto with renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuels, right? Yes. Now, I don't want to be judgmental, but <laughs> again, we want to take care of the earth while finding you know, suitable ways to do financing. And again, this is something that the cryptocurrency community is aware of, and I believe they're addressing it in, in a pretty fast way, because you see a lot of these miners starting to switch over where they can, you know, uh, and it's not possible everywhere, but when you start but to it see- isn't, you, isn't energy fungible though? So if, huh? someone uses green, if someone uses green energy, then that drives up the price of green energy and drives other people towards um, buying unclean energy, doesn't it? Well, now that, I, I, and other people can chime in. I think the cost of green energy is, is going down. Um, for example, solar panels were real expensive years ago, but now the price is going down. And as people start to adopt it more, the price is going to keep going down. So it's kind of like any technology. When the first HD TVs came out, I remember I used to sell them. They were six and 7,000 bucks. I'm talking about for a 32 inch. I'm talking about for a 60 inch. But as more started being processed and, and made, the cost started going down. Now you can get a 60 inch TV for 500 bucks. So I think the same thing is starting to happen with um, green energy that the price that the as more and more people are adopting it and now are at least in America there's a huge push towards charging stations and, and car and green cars and things like that. You're going to see the price of green energy start to go down um, because so there's, everyone... there's um yes so, so there's two two other things that I think are relevant here one one that people um, talk about a lot is is because mining does require energy it, it drives you towards the areas where um, you know that kind of energy is available cheaply 
which is places where it's, you know, ba basically being generated and not being used. So, um, so there, there's kind of an incentive to find surplus energy that would, uh, quote, otherwise be wasted and, and use it for, for these purposes. But I think the more uh, significant thing really is that um, most forms of cryptocurrency are shifting from a proof of work kind of very heavy energy intensive uh, thing to uh, a less intensive mining option such as proof of stake. And Ethereum, for example, is in the process of doing that now. So they're actually changing the, the nature of the, uh, of the cryptocurrency to be less energy intensive. I don't know if right. that's- Thank you for bringing that up because that is true as things start to evolve, they're finding better ways to um, basically do their work as, as was just stated. So now you're having um, updates. Ethereum is going through an update. I believe Bitcoin is going through another. Dogecoin, another popular one, is going through an update. Um, changing their proof of work and, and, and all that to make it more friendly energy-wise. Um, thank you for bringing that up because that, again, that adds to, um, that, that kind of addresses a lot of the objections. Uh, I mean, you have all these miners running these computers and doing this, all this stuff. It's not friendly environmentally, which is true. And it's still true to a certain extent, but it is changing. So let me continue. Now, one of the problems with our traditional financial system in relation to the poor, and I already talked about this and I'll talk about this a little more. Banks exploit the poor in the middle class by charging deposit withdrawal fees, foreign transaction fees, lost card fees, membership service fees, overdraft fees, ATM fees, account closing fees, and many more. These thieves of economic justice steal as much money as they store. I, I probably shouldn't have said that. That's a, that's a little bit mean, but it's true. I remember when I was in Canada and I tr was trying to send money um, back here, it, it's expensive if I wanted to send money in any kind of fast way, like what with a wire transfer. I remember talking to the bank and saying, oh, I need to send my mother some money. Oh, it's gonna cost a hundred bucks. It, it was some ridiculous price. And I said, I guess you can wait for the money. <laughs> I guess they wanna pay it, but Again, if you're rich, they waive these fees. You know, so it's, it's just an unfair system. Two billion people in the world do not have bank accounts. Large amounts of the unbanked live in developing nations where their capital is unprotected. These people typically live in oppressive regimes that manipulate local currencies through taxation and inflation. But you don't have to live in an oppressive regime to experience it. There's lots of people right here in America who, are, who don't have bank accounts. Now, part of the problem is, and I don't talk about this here, but part of the problem is, if you don't have money, why do you want a bank account? Uh, part of this is just poverty. That just People just don't have enough money to open up bank accounts. That basically the money that comes in goes out straight away. So, and I understand that, that, and that's not an issue that even cryptocurrency can necessarily solve. That's more of a societal issue thing. And maybe in my next presentation, I'll talk about um, uh, basic income and other things that, that really do put money in the hands of the poor in a direct way. There are approximately 272 million migrants globally and remittance is a huge source of income for low and middle class countries, totaling 554 billion at the end of 2019. Sending money back is no easy task for a lot of these migrants, especially in the, poor, the poorest among them. This is due to the high cost of international transfers by private companies such as Western Union and MoneyGram. And they, t they charge what I consider a high um, rate. I remember seeing a video where they were talking about an example of someone sending money from the Philippines 
And basically they were charging um, at least 9% of your money just to send it. Now, if you want to send it faster, it's more money. So you can understand the dilemma. If I make a hundred bucks and I have to give off 10, 15% just to send it. Well, I mean, that's money I'm never going to see again. So this is where cryptocurrency comes in. And I feel can help reduce the, fi the friction of global transactions. And one example here is Mexico. The United States and Mexico remittance card is one of the largest in the world due to 2018. Mexico received over $35 billion in migrant remittance inflows. Now remittance is money that people send back to their families. Most of these remittances are sent by electronic wild transfers, which represent about 96% of all remittances. This doesn't count people just putting money in an envelope and just sending it, by the way. The average remittance globally um, is 7.1% how much they charge. This money goes to the company um, prosecuting the, um, the remittance. Technology can have a positive impact on the time and effort required to send and receive remittances. Mexico specifically is estimated that digital remittance could save recipients approximately 15 days over the course of their lives, nearly 100 million hours in aggregate for the economy, and almost 450 million in economic value based on the average income of the uh, Mexican citizen. Cryptocurrency offers a great alternative for people who send and receive remittances. Since cryptocurrency networks charge meager transaction fees as compared to traditional wire transfer, and cryptocurrencies can allow transactions to be completed in a matter of minutes instead of days. And this is crucial before I continue. If you have some a relative who's living in another country that needs money, you know, let's say they're in an accident or something, or, or they don't have enough money for food, you want them to get the money as soon as possible. Um, so this is a big deal if you can speed up if I can just if I can just get on my phone and just send you money to your phone, that's a huge advantage without having to deal with a middle person or a middle man. When Mexicans use a remittance company that is powered by cryptocurrency technology, they save between 2.83 and 5.62% for a $300 remittance. By using cryptocurrency, costs may decrease between 50 and 90% compared to traditional methods. And again, once you have these things in place, you start to help the people who directly need it the most. You cut out that middleman, you cut out that bank with its fees and everything. And then you, you start to begin to make a big difference in people's lives directly. Um, now, I want to continue. I want to use one other example. And this is from an article in the New York Times. I really recommend you guys reading it. The article is called Bitcoin Has Saved My Family. This new, in, in the New York Times article, the author describes how owning Bitcoin helped his brother escape Venezuela. And this is a quote from the article. Cryptocurrency also helped him during a four day trip itself. The Venezuelan military personnel at the borders have a reputation for seizing money of people who want to leave. But Juan, but Juan's being in Bitcoin was accessible only with a password he had memorized. Borderless money is more than a buzzword for those of us living in a collapsing economy and a collapsing dictatorship. I, I really encourage you to read this whole article because it's really fascinating to see how they use cryptocurrency in Venezuela to just live because they're, they're, basically their money is completely collapsed. And this is the only way they can buy bread, medicine, food in a lot of cases. So this is why the advent of cryptocurrency and hopefully its improvement and its implementation 
is going to help a lot of people who normally would not have access to banking services. And again, this is the poor and the lower middle class. In closing, I believe that the promotion of technologies like cryptocurrency will have realized the goals of Christian that of the Christian transhumanists that state, we seek to use science and technology to participate in God's redemptive purpose to cultivate life and renew creation. This is just one tool in our toolbox, and I think it's an important tool to kind of re-energize the financial sector and repurpose it in a way that's much more friendly to people who've normally been excluded out. And, and I really haven't talked about things like, um, you know, that banking it can be changed, that the way you buy a house can be changed, that many fundamental things can be changed. Um, let me stop this for a minute. Many fundamental things can be changed that will benefit people who normally are on the outside looking in of our financial of our financial system. That's it. Any questions, comments, objections? I, can you reread the quote real quick on the borderless money? from the Venezuela article. I oh, thought it was very powerful. Hold on. Let me bring it up, I'm sorry. Oops. Oh, come on. Okay. Let me get back to it. Okay. Here's the quote, cryptocurrency also helped him during his four day trip itself. Now his brother's a lawyer. So he had to take a kind of trip outside the country, but the pro uh, um, uh, I just want to give some context to it. Venezuelan military personnel at the borders have a reputation for seizing money of people who want to leave, but Juan's being in Bitcoin was accessible only with the password he had memorized. Borderless money is more than a buzzword for those who are living in collapsing economies and collapsing dictatorships. That's the um, quote I was looking for. Borderless money is more than just a buzzword for those of us who live in collapsing economies and collapsing dictatorships. Yeah, and, and that's, that, that's, real, that, that's real critical. And you don't have to be in a collapsing economy to, to benefit from this. Um, no, but it, like the reason why I wanted I wanted to bring this up is because, like I always, like y'all have heard me before, kind of say that like some of the best technology uh, can be only discovered if we try to solve the most marginalized the problems of the most marginalized people, because like. Bitcoin is more like cryptocurrency is way more than just a digital remittance system with lower fees because it's so secure that it can enable you to have like a financial system in, within an imploding dictatorship. That's what I'm saying. Like they went, it, it, the technology goes one step further, but precisely because it's prepared for a Venezuela scenario, it's overkill for like Mexican remittances uh, in a good way. Like, you know, and like, you know, way the back propagates. Yeah, and that's true. And also um, with the advent of quantum technology, it's going to be even more secure. Um, you, you're going to see people having access to money that they just would not have access to before we talked about the 2008 crash. I remember I had friends who couldn't get money out of their account. It was frozen or whatever. You don't have that problem with cryptocurrency. I go, as long as I know my password, I can get my money. You know, I can get, now, now the problem is if you forget your password, no one else has it, so you're kind of screwed. And we have stories of that too. Um, but it, it gives you the power 
to control your finances in a way that up until this point have only been access to the very rich. Um, uh, now, that, now, with great power comes great responsibility, as they say in Spider-Man. Um, and, you know, there's some people are complaining, and this actually happened with the advent of Robinhood and other trading platforms. Oh, you know, now people are spending money and they could lose money too. Well, yeah. When you have control, sometimes you have to couple that with education. But um, as far as the way the financial system is stacked up right now, it is not advantageous to have a little bit of money in your account. I mean, you get charged fees. I get charged fees now. I think they, they, they charge me 10 bucks if I don't keep a certain amount there. Well, now in some months, that's great. Like right now, when I'm in between assignments as an Episcopal priest, I don't have quite as much money as I did before. I don't want to have to pay 10 bucks. It's still, it's still 10 bucks or whatever it is. You know, I mean, it's, it's um, and when you're really poor, it really hurts. So this is an opportunity to be able to have a system. And I didn't even talk about the fact that this just makes the transfer of money so much easier. With the advent of near field technology, you don't even need the internet. As long as you have two phones near each other, I can just send you money. And it's totally protected. It's totally secure. You know, no problem. I don't need a bank. I don't need, I don't need to talk to customer service. I don't, you know, I know some of you just love getting on the phone, talking to customer service, begging for, you know, whatever. But, you know, so I, I love that, for example, I love the advent of Cash App and all these other things. I just send people money, you know, and it's easy, just easy peasy. So, you know, I really like where this is going. Granted, there are lots of things that still need to be worked out. Um, especially as far as the green energy part and the other, and, and some of the, and I do want to address one other thing that, that has come up when I've talked about this. And this says, well, criminals use cryptocurrency. I want to point out something to everyone. Criminals have found ways to get money for hundreds of thousands of years. Cryptocurrency is not the reason that hackers now have are suddenly flush with money. Hackers have been able to get money since the advent of the internet. You know, do not blame cryptocurrency for that. You know, that's, that's well, in, kind of in like some ways it's problem. redeeming, right? It's redeeming uh, criminal transactions to generate the basis for the financial system that liberates other people, right? Like I, that's the way I kind of look at it is like, because these transactions are going to take place anyway, might as well do it in a way that supports an open financial system. <laughs> well, that's an ocean to eight kind of way. Of looking at it, but, <laughs> I, but I it's true. I mean, I, I mean, it's true. You're going to have, you're going to have criminals, whether you have cryptocurrency, whether you have traditional money or you have, you know, it's, it, it's almost as if a lot of these people are thinking, you know, well, if we get rid of cryptocurrency, we won't have hacking anymore. That, that's just, that's right. like saying, if, if, you know, if I put up a, a wall, we're not going to have drugs coming into our country anymore. No, the reason drugs come into our country is because people want them. You can put whatever you want up. If there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. So, so I have a question for you. Because yes. um, you and I, back when we could do in-person meetups, uh, which feels like a lifetime ago, um, we chatted um, about how, uh, I love the way you put it, it's like in no sci-fi story are there ever payday loans. And um, <laughs> so it's almost like it's a precondition to a sci-fi society to overcome this kind of financial oppression, like this kind of exploitative structure. So, um, but I, know, I wonder if we agree on this. Personally, I think that one of the revolutions of cryptocurrency is not just in the value of the currency themselves, but is in making it way easier to start a bank and to start financial services so that the competition becomes open and thereby improves the service, which I think is actually the source of a lot of exploitative 
financial behavior from banks. Do you, where, where do you kind of sit on that? Like, do you, do you think it, the, the way we solve exploitative behavior is through more competition or do you think it's more from like regulation or some sort of moral development? Well, no, I, I think that the way you, um, well, let me put it to you this way. Um, you can never get rid of evil totally at least until, you know, depending on what your eschatology is and, and other things. Um, so you're always gonna be dealing with bad actors. What you can do is give a system where everybody's accountable. And this is to me what cryptocurrency does. It gives you a system, for example, you wanna set up an insurance, you, you wanna get insurance. You can set up an app that'll just sell you insurance. You don't need a huge, corporation built around, you know, selling you insurance. That's DeFi. I think it's called DeFi or something like that. Basically, you're developing a system because right now our system is based on, on um, companies or corporation. So if you want health insurance, you have to buy Blue Cross. If you want, well, what if you just had a system where you could just see a doctor? You know, you didn't need a, a blue card, a green card, or you know, whatever, whatever it is, just to go, go, go see a doctor. So yeah, and it's funny you mentioned um, about sci-fi stories. One, one of the things I used to always wonder about Star Trek is how do they pay their bills? You you never hear Captain Kirk saying, "Damn, I gotta get paid." Yeah, I got I, I got my rent due next month or something. Yeah, it, it, you you never hear anything like that because they've moved to, to the point in their society where that's not an issue anymore. And it's almost like in our society, we cannot imagine a society where there are no poor people. It's almost incomprehensible. I don't know if it's our Judeo-Christian background where you know the poor will be with you always, this kind of sentiment. But I think you can develop a society where poverty is, an, is something that people say, wow, I can't believe this used to be like this. And I think we should strive for it. And I think cryptocurrency is one of those tools that, that, that kind of frees us from the shackles of traditional um, financial institutions that are built around profit taking. Remember. The whole point of the bank is to make more money, not to make less, not to save you money. You know, and I used to work in Wall Street, so I know. I, I mean, it's it, it's just a system that is geared towards profit taking, and this is why. And I, I didn't add this in the presentation, but I should have. You see a lot of top financial people saying cryptocurrency is a scam. You had Warren Buffett come out and say it's rat poison. Um, 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 Jay, Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan said this is a scam. Although he just recently changed his mind about that. Now JP Morgan is, is using cryptocurrency assets and offering it to its clients. But you know, when you have Warren Buffett getting up and saying this is rat poison, obviously he's doing he has a reason to say that because he's not into it. So you know, anything that that's not putting money in his pocket is obviously evil to him. Um, but there's, but the trend is a lot of young people are looking at cryptocurrency and saying, I'd rather invest in this than in the stock market. You know, because I have more control over this and I, I can invest in Dogecoin, maybe it goes up a few cents, but I'm making money now as opposed to waiting for some stock to give me a dividend in a year. Um, and yeah, there are risks involved, but there are risks involved in the stock market too. If 2008 proved anything, you can have the safest investment in the world and it can still go to zero. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, this is, this is kind of, uh, 2008 exposed the fallacy of so-called safe money. You know, and that you, that the more direct control you have of your money, the better. Uh, anyone else want to chime in? I'm sorry, I was Mike, thinking did, about I, the, did I go over my, my time? I'm sorry. Oh, you're good, you're good. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I, I was thinking about the fact that, um, a, you know, a lot of the promise of, of Ethereum is not just the money, but also the uh, decentralized institutions, right? So um, this maybe doesn't uh, benefit um, developed world uh, economies as much, right? We've got strong infrastructure, not just for banking, but also for developing companies and, and the infrastructure around that. But yeah, this is something where lots of people don't have access to that. You can't build these kinds of uh, infrastructures in unstable economies, unstable societies, that kind of thing. So yeah, there's this whole area here where um, just giving people access to sort of the organizational tools um, to create you know, financial institutions and so forth is itself a, a kind of empowerment. I think that's interesting. And, and that is to Lorenzo's point, like a place where it seems like it would benefit most obviously from the bottom up, so to speak. Um, and, you know, where, where that, even though that might be a transformative technology uh, long-term, it's going to benefit a lot of people before it hits the, uh, the developed world or the first world um, economies in a significant way. And you see a cryptocurrency taking off in places like India, Nigeria, Kenya, um, a lot of places where, where people don't necessarily have access to traditional banking methods, but they want to be able to transfer money and to, and to um, still do certain things. So you're going to see, um, and you're going to see as more people people adopt cryptocurrency in first world situations uh, um, or in um, developed countries like ours. I mean, you already see it in one sense, uh, all of these companies coming up, these, these um, companies coming up for banking services where they don't charge fees, for example. I mean, I, I just got an email from T-Mobile saying, hey, you can, you can deposit money with us. So when did T-Mobile turn into a bank? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it's the same thing that's happening that, that's kind of revolutionizing, for example, cable TV. It used to be you can only get tape, cable TV from certain three or four companies. And if those three or four companies were in your town, you were screwed. You paid whatever they said. Now you have YouTube TV. If you have internet, you have cable TV. And, you know, I mean, so you see this change coming in our society where things are just becoming decentralized and there's pushback because the people who are invested in the you know i mean it's kind of like when the car came every horse and buggy company didn't like it but you know at some point you got to decide this this is the future either i'm going to be in it in, into it or i'm not my one of my lines on this is that I think uh, crypto is going to do to banks what social media did to newspapers. In terms of like just disrupting the kind of dominant form, which then I keep thinking, okay, but like social media has also done bad stuff, like with the conspiracy theories and stuff. So what is the equivalent of a conspiracy theory on crypto? Uh, or or what <laughs> M M MP3s did to vinyl, you yeah. know, or or, or what you know, uh, media did to Blockbuster. I mean, I remember getting tapes from Blockbuster. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all the Blockbusters closed because who wants to take out a tape when I can just download a movie from my TV? Yeah, but I, I think the, the difference is that, like, in the case of banks, though, we're talking about some of the most powerful institutions on the planet, whether we're talking about government banks or private banks. Like, it's, uh, I think it's really exciting to, uh, it, I mean, I think it's like a Gutenberg type moment where all of a sudden, like you go from like, you know, like a centralized system that maintains order, right? Into a rapidly decentralizing system from which then new things emerge. But I think that banks are like any other large corporation. I, I kind of I kind of think it's equivalent to what's happening in the auto industry. Who would have thought Ford would have come out and said, we're gonna go all electric in X amount of year. I never thought I'd hear that statement from Ford, GM. 
Now, all of these companies are on the bandwagon. Oh, we got to go electric by 2030. Or That's a huge sea change. And now the oil companies, you know, you even see Saudi Arabia, the biggest oil producer in the world, saying, we're going to go solar. We're going to go green. We're, we're going to shift our whole economy because you understand, because fundamentally these companies want to make money. And if making money means going green, or they're gonna find a way to monetize that. I mean, do not fool yourself into thinking that banks are, are, are going to go away. They, will, they are going to adapt to this quick or sooner rather than later. They're gonna howl about it, you know, but they are going to change. I, I guess <laughs> I, I agree, but I think also part of it is that we're going to have new banks. Oh like, yeah. I think, in a, in a, in a, but in I think you know, in my ways, like the way you redeem capitalism is by basically turning it into a turnover machine, where like there's always going to be like somebody on top, but as long as they're not the same people, like <laughs> generation to generation, that's okay. Well, well, I want to, well, that, well, that's a, that. Well, Lorenzo, that's an excellent point, uh, but uh, I want you to think about what happened in the '90s with computer companies. Who was in charge in the 90s? IBM. IBM, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that, that have gone out of business. But when all of these startup companies started, they didn't know what to do. They ignored them. They said, oh, this is just a flash in the pan. Who cares? You know, but then they realized this is the future. And finally, I think IBM has finally turned it around, but some companies didn't like, for example, Kodak. Where's Kodak now? Nowhere. You know, who buys film now? Nobody. Except maybe some art tours or so. Or so. You know, but they didn't change fast enough. And, you know, a lot of these companies in the 90s who were making computers, they could have never seen the smartphone. When Apple came out with the smartphone, that was like a nuclear bomb going off in the, in the industry, you know? Yeah, like BlackBerry uh, is now a software company because well, they lost to the it, iPhone exactly. so badly. Exactly, I remember having the BlackBerry phone and thinking that this will never get replaced until it was. <laughs> and, and who knows what, what, you know, you can't even, and, and you know, it's funny, just as a side note, I think a lot of traditional churches are finding themselves in this bind too. When, when, when the coronavirus came out, you saw a lot of churches just say, what do you mean I have to go on Zoom? And you saw how churches were screaming at the government, you have to let us meet. You have to let us meet. This is killing us. They couldn't adapt. They had no idea. What do you mean? Nobody wants to meet online. What are you talking about? My kids are online all the time. They play video games. The CTA is online <laughs> all the time. Yes. <laughs> And look, I love seeing you guys. I, I love. I would love to have a beer with you guys, but I equally enjoy my time online. It's 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 seamless to me. But for for bigger institutions that are used to doing things their way, they're gonna have to learn the hard way, you know. And and you know, it, it's unfortunate, but it's going. It's it, it's going to with banks. I think banks are finally fi at least. The, the banks that, that um, especially the financial institution, the, the, the JP Morgans and, and things like that, they're realizing their clients want crypto. So they need to get on board with it. I mean, they can scream all they want about this is, you know, this Bitcoin isn't based on anything. Okay, it's worth 32,000 bucks. Well, I, I don't care if you don't know what, what that means, but it's made a lot of people rich. So. You better figure it out. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I have to head out, but this was a great combo. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for doing this presentation. Hey, um, thank you um, for everybody joining in. Um, by the way, whoever's doing Sunday school, get in touch with me so we can see how, how I can um, get on board with it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Omar. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll talk next time.